Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, um, Older Adults and Colorectal Cancer. Um, we're excited um, to have you here today. Um, so today's speaker, we have Dr. Grant Williams. Uh, we're really looking forward to him uh, presenting on the topic area this morning or this afternoon if you're on the, on the East Coast. Um, just a quick reminder, after the webinar, you will be emailed um, a link to the webinar archive where you can access the live recording of the webinar, you can download the slides, um, or you can listen to an audio recording. Um, our team is uh, tweeting, so you can follow the hashtag CRCWebinar and join us in the conversation. And again, some logistics with the webinar tech. If you have a question, you can type it into the question box. And at the end of the webinar, we will do our best to address all the questions asked. Right, CRC does offer a number of resources in addition to our webinars. We have the Tabuti podcast where we discuss taboo topics in colorectal cancer. We have mini magazines which dive into a variety of different topics. And of course, your guide in the fight um, which is a wonderful resource uh, for folks diagnosed uh, stage three and four. As a reminder, the information and services provided by Fight CRC are for general informational purposes only. The information and services are not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you are ill or suspect that you are ill, please see a doctor immediately and in an emergency call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Fight CRC never recommends or endorses any specific physicians, products, or treatments for any condition. And finally, um, again, we're super excited to have Dr. Williams on with us today. Um, he's an oncologist, a geriatrician, um, and has done a lot of great work in the field. Um, and we're excited to have him here today. So thank you, Dr. Williams. I will hand over the controls to you and let you take it from here. Hi, so thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me and allowing me to speak about this, a very important topic. Uh, so like she said, I'm a medical oncologist that takes care of GI malignancy, so colorectal cancers is one of the primary cancers that I treat, but I'm also a geriatrician. So clinically, as well as from a research standpoint, I really focus on the intersection of cancer and aging and, and really trying to improve how we treat older adults with cancer. So first, starting out with a little bit of an outline as what I'll be talking about today. The, the first is about assessing the older adult with cancer, as well as some background about um, the older adult with cancer. And then I'm going to focus on some specific issues that are points of, of research, but some things in the field that, that we're trying to improve in this area, focusing on geriatric assessment, um, as well as sarcopenia or body composition. And then lastly, briefly touch a little bit on cancer survivorship. So first off, cancer is really predominantly a disease of aging. So along with the aging process, uh, there are a lot of changes that happen that lead to mutations and, and that make older adults at higher risk for cancer. And so here are some actual age-specific incidence rates for cancer. And as you can see here, it's really not until the fourth or fifth and really sixth decade of life that the incident rates for, for cancer really goes up. So already, when you include all cancers, the vast majority of cancer diagnosis and the way vast majority of cancer deaths occur in older adults. And the actual median age of a cancer diagnosis in the United States is 67. Now, these are actually a reflection of kind of older numbers um, from SEER, which is where we get a lot of our incidence rates and prevalence for, for cancer. But with the aging of the baby boomer generation, it's estimated that 70% of all new cancer diagnosis by 2030 will be in those old at the age of 65. Now, you know, here we're really trying to focus on colon cancer, and these are actually the most recent numbers for colon cancer. So it pretty much mirrors or matches the overall incidence uh, with the median age of 67. And you can see the majority of um, diagnosis for colon cancer occur over the age of 65. There are patients in the 40s and 50s that also develop cancer, and I know there's been this um, uptick in, in even younger patients for the incidence of colon cancer, but really still the vast majority of these diagnoses are occurring in older adults. 
So I think when we talk about aging, first, it's really important to actually think of this in contrast to, to really development. So we all start our lives as a child or a baby and, and really go through these developmental milestones. Now, these are very linear and fairly predictable and things that pediatricians on a very regular basis uh, assess um, during their clinic visits. Things such as at 12 months of age, they should be able to sit up unsupported. By 18 months, they should be able to say single words and, and be able to stand up and walk. By two, they're able to say sentences with two to four words. And these things are very regular and predictable, and you know, we're able to assess these things on a regular basis and know whether you're behind or on these milestones. But going into the second or third decade of life, that aging or development process ceases and the aging process begins. Now, unlike the developmental process, the aging process is very heterogeneous in that based on lifestyle factors, genetic factors, or environmental factors, the pace of aging is very unique to the individual. Now, you may not be able to, to notice these differences in the aging process between people in the third or fourth decade of life, but when you start getting in the sixth, seventh, or eighth decade of life, these things start to become more noticeable. To highlight that, we may have some 80-year-olds that remain very physically fit up into their 80s, have very few medical conditions, and take very few medications and are able to be very active, such as going barefoot water skiing. And on contrast to that, we have very patients that are the exact same age and may have significant disability limitations related to medical problems, requiring multiple medications to manage their medical issues. And I would really say these really represent the ends of the spectrum um, for patients of this same age. Now, if everyone who came into clinic fit in one of these two categories, I think this would all be fairly simple. But really, that represents really just a spectrum of which all patients kind of fall on as far as their overall health. And what I think is important to realize is chronological age itself really is insufficient to really tease out this differences in this population. So when an older adult is diagnosed and treated for cancer, their outcomes are highly variable. We have some patients that are able to tolerate aggressive treatments, whether it's surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, and have similar outcomes to younger patients. Those are often the patients that we see in clinical trials that are in the seventh or eighth decade of life. But then we know that we have other patients that either are frail or pre-frail, and cancer therapy may not make as much sense or it may make them at higher risk for having other adverse or, or poor outcomes. And it's really this very highly variable um, tolerance to treatment as well as outcomes that makes this population particularly challenging. What we do know is, is how someone's health is at the time of the cancer diagnosis has a great impact on how those patients are able to tolerate treatment and their overall outcomes. So how do we assess older adults to kind of get the sense as to what their overall functional physiological age is? And really this remains a very big clinical challenge. We know that age itself, as well as something that we call performance status, which is a, a very crude measure of, of overall function that oncologists typically use, you know, those two measures alone are really insufficient to really tease out this spectrum of, of physiologic aging. And really we need to find better ways to assess older adults so that we can get a better sense of who may benefit from more aggressive treatments and who are those that may be at risk for having you know, poor outcomes in addition to what we can do to improve those outcomes. So this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about geriatric assessment. So first off, what is a geriatric assessment? So it's a multidimensional interdisciplinary diagnostic process that focuses on determining older person's medical, psychosocial, and functional capabilities. So I really think of this simply as a very broad, multi-domain assessment of a patient. So all the domains that are pertinent to a patient's overall physical health is, is included in this. So this includes functional status, which we call instrumental and activities of daily living and activities of daily living, like your ability to live independently, get out of bed, brush your teeth, take your medicines, as well as cognition, other medical problems you might have, your nutrition, as well as polypharmacy or what medications you take, depression and anxiety, and really does a comprehensive, systematic assessment of all these areas. 
I think it's important to realize that a geriatric assessment involves not only an evaluation, but management as well. So, you know, this is a systematic evaluation of all these domains, but many of these things that it uncovers can actually have uh, treatments, such as unmasking either distress or depression, then we have, you know, treatments and things we can do for that. If we notice functional status um, issues, or problems and limitations, we actually have interventions for that, such as physical or occupational therapy as well. Now, there's a lot of challenges to what is uh, typically um, performed as a geriatric assessment. Typically, these would be done in about two to four hours at a, a specialized geriatrician's office and requires, you know, assessments by the geriatrician as well as potentially a pharmacist and a, a physical therapist and really requires this kind of prolonged assessment. And, and unfortunately, in oncology, you know, the, these, this is the vast majority of cancer diagnosis, and it's not really possible for all these patients to be seen by a geriatrician and have this full evaluation. So recognizing this as a challenge um, was one of the first big steps in our field of really developing more of a questionnaire base or um, tool that can be used that assesses all these things that can be predominantly completed by a patient. So this table just gives some examples of some of the things that are, are actually measured um, on one of the more commonly used survey uh, for a geriatric assessment, which has been um, pioneered by the Cancer and Aging Research Group here in the United States. And as you can see, it's broken into two parts. So there's only a small portion of it is actually done by the nurse or the health professional, but the majority of this is actually questionnaire based and reported by the patient. And what's most important about this tool is that it only takes about five minutes of the nurse or someone at check-in to complete some of these other tasks that need to be you know, facilitated by the clinic staff. And then about 20 to 25 minutes of the patient's time filling out the rest of the questionnaire. And, and ideally this can be done either before the clinic visit and sent in advance or while waiting in the waiting room, you know, some of those, the, the time that's typically not utilized during a clinic visit. So in roughly 30 minutes or less, we're able to really get this comprehensive assessment that can give us a little bit better idea of physiologic or functional age. And actually here at UAB, we've developed our own questionnaire we've um, entitled the Cancer and Aging Resilience Evaluation. And, and how this differs is actually we've made it 100% patient reported. So this is basically a, a questionnaire that we give to all the patients that we've really started here in the um, GI clinics. And anyone over the age of 60 completes this questionnaire at their initial visit. And it really allows us to get this comprehensive assessment across all of our patients. Now, we actually timed this and looked at some of the, the feasibility and the questionnaire. And now, the way we're doing it is actually only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to complete. And uh, about 85% of patients say that it's the, the right length and easy to do during their routine appointment. So, you know, what are the benefits of using something like a geriatric assessment? Well, I think even in those simplistic terms, you can kind of break these patients into different categories where we can more accurately identify those patients that are fit, that don't have functional impairments or significant medical problems, and those that really, you know, frankly need to be treated just like any other patient and really need to be recommended the more aggressive treatments. Then we're also able to kind of tease out this group that may be vulnerable. And I think this is one of the more important groups that, that often get missed in a routine clinic visit. So these are patients that generally are doing quite well, but are vulnerable and, and potentially can be unmasked to have medical problems when they undergo cancer therapy. And this is the group that I think most needed to be targeted for interventions to see how we can actually improve their tolerability of treatment. And then lastly, those patients that are frail, that have disability or multiple or life-threatening medical problems, um, I think these are patients that are more often identified during the routine um, examination, but it also is able to identify this group that, that maybe more aggressive treatment may not make sense and focus more on symptom or palliative treatment and or less aggressive cancer treatments may be more beneficial. Now, clearly all this is, you know, weighed together with patients' preferences and, and really what's important for them, whether it is life extension or quality of life or, or you know, trying to minimize symptoms. So when we really think of the overall value of the geriatric assessment in the cancer area, one thing that can be very helpful is it can actually allow for a better life expectancy estimate. So for colon cancer, a lot of times when we talk about adjuvant therapy and the potential benefit of using chemotherapy after surgery, a lot of that has to do with, you know, how long someone will live. If we're giving chemotherapy to prevent recurrence, you know, if a patient dies of heart failure in the next two to three years, adjuvant chemotherapy is really not going to be at all helpful. So I'd say for, for adjuvant therapy, 
therapy discussions in colon cancer as well as breast cancer and other areas like prostate cancer, this can be a very helpful tool. In other settings when we're considering chemotherapy, it's also helpful to really be able to predict how the tolerability of, of chemotherapy and, and what's the risk of toxicity. You know, patients want to know how what kind of symptoms and side effects they're going to have, and I think this can better tease out what the actual risks are of having those toxicities, and I'll present some of that data just in a second. It definitely uncovers problems that are not routinely found. Um, I, there's been a lot of information looking at things such as falls, which have been shown to increase your risk of chemotherapy toxicity, yet are rarely addressed during a routine um, clinic visit, and also have proven and evidence-based interventions. So there are multiple areas where it's able to uncover problems, many of which may actually have interventions. And lastly, is the, the thing I just alluded to is that you know, not only is this thing able to evaluate an older patient, estimate life expectancy and, and tolerability of treatment, but it also, a lot of the things it picks up have beneficial interventions. So we can try to improve function in, in those with disability or at risk for, for having functional limitations with treatment. Uh, it can focus on quality of life and, and trying to improve overall outcomes for this population. So I wanted to include some specific data to colorectal cancer, and these are new patients, older adults diagnosed with, with colon cancer. And you can see that there is a high prevalence overall of a lot of these um, geriatric issues that, that, that have been identified. So over half of this group was actually found to have um, significant comorbid illnesses or other medical problems. And on top of that, many of these patients had geriatric syndrome, such as falls or frailty, and several of them ha had limitations in their functional status as in disability. Now, I think what's important about this Venn diagram is to actually show that these are different constructs and different problems, sometimes of which overlap. So about 16% of this population had disability, multi uh, severe medical problems, as well as geriatric syndromes. But these are also separate issues in and of themselves. Looking at the same population is showing the survival based on those different groups. So the blue line there um, is, looks at survival over time from colorectal cancer diagnosis with time and months across the bottom and actually shows you those without significant um, medical problems, limitations, or geriatric syndromes actually do quite a bit better than those that were in the brown that actually had all three of those. So I think this is not only something that's highly prevalent, but actually something that is highly important in this and has a big difference in how patients do long term. So one of the biggest challenges myself as a medical oncologist is, is talking about chemotherapy and, and really discussing the risk of chemotherapy toxicity. And actually, some of the pioneering work in the field done by Arthi Hurria, who's now out at City of Hope, looked at a population of about 500 patients, many of which had GI cancers, and tried to look at what factors from a laboratory standpoint, as well as a geriatric assessment, really predicted for poor tolerance or severe chemotherapy toxicity. Now, a lot of things they found um, included whether it was standard versus reduced dose chemotherapy, how many chemotherapy drugs you had, kidney function, and whether a patient was anemic or had a low hemoglobin. But what was most important in this area was recognizing many of these things that are often overlooked in a routine clinic visit actually are important and are related, independently related to chemotherapy toxicity such as the presence of one or more falls in the last six months, noted almost a 2.5 um, increase in, in severe chemotherapy toxicity. In addition, hearing impairment, limitations in walking a block, patients needing assistance with daily medications, or decreased social activity was all related to severe chemotherapy toxicity. Now, you can see there are scores on the right side, and, and simply you basically go through this calculator and fill in all these questions and add up an overall score with the range of 0 to 25. And you can see from the figure here that this actually was able to stratify or differentiate those patients that were going to really high risk for chemotherapy toxicity, such in the 90% range, versus those that were very low risk for chemotoxicity, which would be in the 25% range. Now, if you compare this to what is our standard assessment of the Karnofsky performance status or just a general performance status measure, you know, typically 100 is, is noted to be at the very high or without any limitations, and 70 or less as being those patients that have significant limitations limitations. And you can see here the number of uh, chemo severe chemotherapy toxicities was really about the same across that entire group. So this didn't really seem like something that was very predictive of chemotherapy toxicity. 
In terms of actually predicting impairments, this is some of the work that we did while we were at UNC. We actually looked at those patients using that same Karnofsky performance status measure, looked at those patients that actually rated themselves as well as the, the physician rated them as having a normal um, performance status. So that's that is 80 or higher. And then we looked at our geriatric assessment results and tried to look at what impairments exist in that group. So only about 30% of patients that were in the normal range actually had no geriatric assessment impairments. But about 28% of the population had one, 18% had two, and about 25% had three or more deficits as identified by the geriatric assessment. Now, some people may say, you know, are these important? Well, many of these are actually things such as falls and limitations in walking one block, which we just showed puts you at patients at very high risk for chemotherapy toxicity. So that I'd argue that a lot of these impairments that go missed by our typical assessment are actually very, very important. And lastly, just to, to highlight, and I'm not going to go into all the poten potential interventions that can be done, but I thought I'd focus on at least one domain of the geriatric assessment, physical performance, and look at some things that could be considered for interventions. So under the physical performance uh, assessment domain, it includes a falls history, uh, a physical function battery, and well as assessing for neuropathy. And if these things are actually identified, it could make sense to actually include a consultation for physical therapy as well as occupational therapy for either balance, strength training, as well as the use of assistant device evaluations, a home safety evaluation or modification, particularly in the settings of fall history, including um, the life alert system, um, and as well as an osteoporosis risk review could, could all make sense. So there's a lot of actual interventions that can be done um, based on the interventions for these impairments identified by a geriatric assessment. And I don't need everyone to read this entire slide, but the same is true for cognition, social support, anxiety, depression, nutrition. There's a lot of interventions that can actually be done, and, and many of these are being done not only here, but other places across the United States using this assessment to really drive interventions to improve outcomes in this population. So I thought it would be important to realize that although we talk about, you know, aging being the number one risk factor for cancer, unfortunately, this is one of the unmodifiable risk factors. Um, but for colon cancer, there are a lot of things that we can do about other modifiable risk factors. Um, and I think those things are the ones that we hear a lot about more, such as physical activity, avoiding obesity, and those sorts of things. Now, next going to the next topic is actually sarcopenia. So a little bit of background here. Um, losses in muscle mass as muscle strength as occur as part of the, the routine aging process. So unfortunately, beginning about the second or third decade to life, we start seeing pretty dramatic decreases in the um, amount of muscle mass presented here in the figure. You can see this is pretty dramatic over the lifespan and just decreases uh, long, uh, linearly with time starting at that third or fourth decade of life. And we see similar things when we actually look at strength. Um, this is actually looking at, for men, the clean jerk uh, world records um, for strength assessment. And unfortunately, these also just decline over the lifespan. And I like to use this quote. So Dr. Rosenberg was actually the first person who coined the term sarcopenia. And, and he noted there's probably no decline in structure or function more dramatic than the decline in lean body mass or muscle mass over the decades of life. So in oncology, one of the things, particularly for GI malignancies and colon cancer, that we have a whole lot of is actually CT scans. Now, these are typically done up front for the purposes of staging, um, to evaluate response to treatment, as well as in survivorship to, to make sure that there's no cancer recurrence. But at the same time, this can actually be utilized for more things than just cancer for the purposes of cancer. And actually, we can use this to quantify some of the body composition. So you can see here down on the, the left is actually a single slice from a, a, a typical CT scan. Now, from the general approach um, to make this systematic across the board, we usually use the L3 landmark, so the third lumbar vertebrae as the single cross-sectional image that's used. And actually, we use that to actually measure the amount of muscle mass as well as visceral and subcutaneous fat. And then we take the amount of muscle that you can see here highlighted in red, divide that by height in meters squared, and actually come up with something called a skeletal muscle index. And this is something that we use to kind of quantify the amount of skeletal muscle. So again, this is one of those things that, you know, at the, the dramatic ends of the spectrum and, and a patient that has lots of muscle or is very cachectic and has very little, this can be very easy to kind of eyeball 
But again, it's all these patients in between that can be much more challenging. And to highlight that, here's some, some CTs from one of the larger studies in JCO, uh, the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2013. And this looks at, shows three different patients that have the exact same BMI or body mass index and shows how dramatically different the amount of muscle they can have. So you can see the patient on the left has a very low skeletal muscle index at 33. And even visually, you can see that there's very small amounts of muscle. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the patient on the right who has you know, a significant amount of muscle uh, and a much higher skeletal muscle index. And these patients visually may look fairly similar. Now on the flip side of that, we're gonna have one patient or three different patients that have the exact same amount of muscle, but very, very different body mass index. So you can see here on the left, you have a patient with a BMI of 40, and on the right, on the bottom, a BMI of 15. Now these patients, all three, have nearly the exact same um, amount of actual muscle. And you can see that this can be one of the more challenging things to just assess from, from just the naked eye. And this just graphically represents those patients uh, that we just showed. So the blue are the patients with the identical amount of muscle, and the yellow shows those um, with varying amounts of skeletal muscle with the identical BMI. So I think when, you, when we actually talk about sarcopenia, it's important to realize this is a lot like osteoporosis as far as the overall story goes. So in early life is really when you develop a lot of your muscle mass and your muscle strength, just like where you develop a lot of your bone is, um, from bone health standpoint. And it's around that second or third decade of life that we start seeing this fall off that just continues with increasing age. What's important is to realize there's actually a very big range between individuals as far as what's the rate of muscle mass loss and muscle strength loss, and you can see a lot of variability in this, particularly in older adults. In addition, I think it's important to realize, although sarcopenia is classically thought of as an age-related condition, there are a lot of other factors that can really have a big impact, particularly in older adults with cancer. So not only are older adults and generally at risk because of other medical conditions, reduced physical activity, and other changes in, in, the, in hormones for having sarcopenia. But now, if it, at the time of a cancer diagnosis, there's multiple other, in, other things that can impact their overall amount of muscle. Part of these are cancer-related, such as changes in, in nutrition related to anorexia, as well as specifically tumor and pro-inflammatory cytokines and, and changes in their overall metabolism. And then once you start treatment, things such as chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, as well as a lot of the medications that go along with that, can pretty have a, a pretty dramatic um, impact on patients' uh, amount of muscle. So these patients are really under kind of a triple threat between aging, cancer, and treatment-related losses for muscle mass. So why are we really talking about muscle mass and, and body composition, particularly in oncology? One important thing is the overall prevalence of, of low muscle mass or sarcopenia in this population, particularly even just talking about colon cancer. So although this is generally an age-related condition and we see rates as high as 60 to 70 percent in those over the age of 70, it's also important to note that, that low muscle mass can be found in patients even under the age of 60 or even under 50 in these circumstances. And I think a lot of that has to do with the cancer-related and treatment-related um, impact uh, on sarcopenia. And in addition to that, we found that patients that have low muscle mass are at significantly increased risk for chemotherapy toxicities, surgical complications, and overall inferior survival. So here's some survival curves looking at um, different patients, whether they had low muscle mass or not, or sarcopenia or not, and looking at their survival over time. Now, these are patients with early stage colon cancer, so stage one, two, and three, after their diagnosis, and, and looks at their differences in survival. And you can see, you know, there's pretty significant differences um, within 10 years of diagnosis just based on the fact of whether they had sarcopenia or not. There are other important things that we're actually able to get from these CT scans than just the amount of muscle. So one thing that we can also look at is the, uh, the quality of that muscle. Um, what happens, particularly in the aging process, is that there can be what we call myosteatosis or intramuscular fat content deposited within the muscle. Um, and this is something on a CT scan that we can actually look at as density. So it's measured in the units of Hounsfeld's. And we can actually look at kind of what the quality of that muscle is beyond just how much muscle there is. And this scan actually shows you kind of differences in that. So these patients have relatively closely similar amounts of muscle. 
but the biggest difference is the patient on the left has a higher density, that's that red. And then the one on the, the right actually has much more of that yellow and blue, which really represents lower Hounsfeld's units or lower density and suggesting increases in intramuscular fat. So interestingly, this is actually a lot like what the field of, of steaks um, is interested in. So here, this is actually how they grade steaks and that marbling you see. So marbling in a steak is actually really that intramuscular fat that you're seeing um, within the, the muscle. Um, you can see here the this quality grade one has very, very little intramuscular fat, and this all the way down at the bottom on the right actually has very high amounts of intramuscular um, fat. Now, I think it's important to realize what you want in your steak is not necessarily what you want in the, in the muscles in your body. So we would prefer to have very little um, fat deposits within our, our muscle uh, for us, but then when we're looking for a nice juicy steak, we would want some, uh, we want some of this intramuscular fat. So looking a little bit more at some of the actual data in, in colorectal cancer, this is a study that, that we looked at the chemotherapy toxicity based on whether patients had low muscle mass or not. And, and here you can see when we looked at grade three and four toxicities, we found about 11% difference um, in, in that population. And actually on the right is where we actually looked at skeletal muscle gauge, which included both the amount of muscle and the quality of muscle. And that's when we started to see really dramatic differences. So a 40% difference in the risk of severe chemotherapy toxicities, basically dependent on what that number looks like to skeletal muscle gauge. So this is something that can be actually very predictive of a lot of important outcomes, particularly in this population. Now, one thing I wanted to mention that is kind of something that we're, we're beginning to look at is actually how chemotherapy is dosed. So this is the original paper that created the um, body surface area um, value that we use to dose pretty much all chemotherapy in the fields of oncology. And, and this is actually, interestingly, something that was developed in 1916 and really hasn't fundamentally been changed. So over 100 years ago, they developed this formula for body surface area that we use to dose chemotherapy. Now, what's important to realize is this only takes your height and weight into account when you're actually dosing the chemotherapy drugs. And what we know from pharmacology is that depending on which chemotherapy drug you have, uh, they may differently um, distribute within the body, whether that's within the muscle or the fatty tissue, and actually what we call the volume of distribution or the actual amount of area where these drugs actually circulate can be highly dependent on body composition. So one of the questions and one of the things that, that we're looking into is, you know, how can a lot of these body composition measures actually affect the drug levels in a person? So along with the aging process, when we see losses of muscle mass, we actually see increases in, in fat. And what we don't see is that actually your height and weight really doesn't change all that much over the lifespan. But at the same time, your, the distribution of fat versus muscle very much does. So I think a lot of the questions that we're seeing about this increased chemotherapy toxicity is a question of, you know, is it potential that these patients are actually getting higher f drug levels within their body and, and are technically being overdosed by body surface area calculations? And on the flip side, are there those patients that have very large amounts of muscles potentially being underdosed when using this calculation? And there's some evidence to actually suggest this might be the case. So when we looked at chemotherapy toxicities against body surface area or looking at the actual dose of chemotherapy per the amount of muscle mass you have, we see pretty dramatic differences. So when you're looking at the differences by body surface area here on the left, we're not seeing much differences in chemotherapy toxicities, whereas on the right, looking at incidence of dose limiting toxicities, and those patients that had really high amounts of drug per their amount of muscle versus those that had very low amounts of drug per body mu their, their muscle area, we saw very dramatic differences, about 30% in the incidence of dosamine toxicity. So these are things that actually we have studies ongoing looking at pharmacokinetics to try to prove this point and, and further actually refine chemotherapy dosing based potentially on some of these body composition metrics that are frankly available as part of routine care because these CT scans are done as part of routine clinical care. So lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about survivorship. 
So thankfully, related to a lot of advances that we've had in oncology, both in, in colorectal cancer as well as many cancers, we're seeing more and more survivors than ever before. It's estimated that in 2016, we had 15.5 million cancer survivors. And as many of you know, we already have over 1 million colorectal cancer um, survivors. I think this is important to note, you know, who are these patients? Well, many of these patients are actually older adults. Um, already the majority of them are now, but if you fast forward to 2040, we're going to be seeing significant increases in cancer survivors, thankfully. But the vast majority of these patients are going to be in the 65 to 75 range, 75 plus, or even over the age of 85. So the vast majority of these are going to be older adults. So what is the actual cost of a cure? Now, I think as medical oncologists or any anyone in the oncology um, clinical arena, you know, we really are good at focusing on the short-term side effects uh, of our treatments. Whether it be chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation, we often have detailed conversations about the risk of, of toxicity, such as fatigue, nausea, vomiting, hair loss, neuropathy, a lot of these things that, that we, you know, frankly see immediately during treatment and that we're very adept at, at managing. I think one of the things that the whole field kind of falls short on is looking at the long-term side effects of chemotherapy toxicity or, or any treatment or any cancer treatment that is. These are less understood and less recognized. And frankly, you know, once you enter into survivorship, we don't see these patients as much. And I think often when these other problems come up, they're not linked back to their prior cancer treatment. But we do see high rates of cardiovascular issues, redu reductions in pulmonary function, endocrine abnormalities, neuropathy, cognitive dysfunction, cancer related to the treatment from the first cancer. And these are things that are just now beginning to be um, evaluated and better understood. Now, when thinking about survivorship, it's important to, to really look actually at the opposite end of the spectrum. So not looking at older adults per se, but looking at childhood cancer survivors where a lot of this um, research was really pioneered in the survivorship area. This is actually a study looking at adult survivors of childhood cancers. So these are not older adults, but they're patients in their 20s to, to 50s, and actually looked at the cancer survivors compared to their siblings and looked at their overall chronic health conditions. So, you know, they matched them to siblings so that we could find patients that are similar age and also had similar um, environmental and genetics um, as the actual cancer patient. And what's concerning here is we actually saw a, a, almost a double in the amount of, of overall medical problems in the cancer survivors. And when we looked at more severe um, comorbid conditions, they had a five-fold higher increase of severe um, medical um, conditions. Now, when we actually broke this down and looked at the relative risk of these issues, we, we found almost a 50 times higher risk of requiring joint replacement, seeing higher times higher risk of, of developing heart failure, as well as um, secondary cancers. And as far as cognitive dysfunction, we saw a tenfold higher incidence in those patients that are cancer survivors. So we're seeing these very dramatically increased risk of other health conditions in patients that are cancer survivors. Here we're actually looking at, again, survival curves. So this is time on the bottom and, and the actual survival estimates on the, the left side. And what we're looking at is the the overall U.S. population, and, and the blue line is actually patients that are five-year cancer survivors, childhood cancer survivors. So typically, in a lot of patients that, that pass away from these conditions, you know, that usually happens within the first five years from diagnosis. So these are actually looking at more long-term survivors. And what we're seeing is there is a difference in the overall survival of these patients up to even 30 years after their cancer diagnosis. Now, a few of these may be related to recurrences, but the vast majority is when you get 10 to 20 years out are related to cardiovascular um, episodes or issues, as well as the increase in, in secondary cancers that we see related to the prior cancer treatment. So I think, you know, a lot of the impact of the cancer treatments happen long after treatment is completed. And this is one study we did that was actually not in colon cancer, but in breast cancer, but I think kind of as a, a proof of concept or a point for this. And we actually looked at how chemotherapy affects molecular aging or some of these biomarkers of aging that we use. 
So we actually had 33 women with early stage breast cancer and looked at a P16 marker, which is a marker of cellular senescence. So this is a, a biomarker that really follows the trajectory of aging um, in humans as well as in, in mice and, and other species. And what we did is we checked the levels of P16 before chemotherapy and then after the completion chemotherapy at several time points. So it's important to realize chemotherapy in this setting, much like it would be in colon cancer, is curative. So the point of this is to, to decrease the recurrence of, of their cancer, and hopefully these patients go on to be long-term cancer survivors. So here is actually looking at uh, the prospective or the patients that had the pre, post, and then up to one year later. And what we found was a pretty dramatic increase in this P16, up to a whole log um, increase and P16 values. And actually, to look at this a different way, we did a cross-sectional sample of patients that had completed treatment and then looked at those that had or had not received chemotherapy and found that those that had received chemotherapy in red actually had higher P16 levels compared to those that did not have chemotherapy. Now, when we actually extrapolate this to the normal aging in, in P16 values, what this was was a, about a 15-year increase in this senescence marker just in a very short time with chemotherapy therapy. So I think there's still work that needs to be done in kind of confirming this, but this really suggests this pro-aging or geriatrogenic effect potentially of chemotherapy that I think is, is very you know, concerning that we're seeing in, in, in these patient populations. And I think clinically we see this as well. You know, going through a lot of this chemotherapy and the treatment for cancer, frankly, is, it has an aging effect and, and has long-term impacts on patients. So this is a study um, cross-sectional just looking at a cancer population matched to a non-cancer population um, from, from the Medicare, from SEER Medicare. And here you can actually see much higher uh, functional limitations uh, and activities they did living, instrumental activities living, higher incidence of falls, osteoporosis and incontinence, higher frailty and higher rated um, poor or fair, fair um, health status by patients that have cancer compared to those that don't have cancer. So I think this is more of an older adult specific. So these are all patients over 65 and looking at these important health impairments. And again, we're seeing these much higher um, prevalences in patients that have a history of cancer. So how are we to, to care for this growing population? So I think the issue surrounding cancer survivorship has been widely recognized more recently. You know, the Institute of Medicine Committee on Cancer Survivorship in 2005 urged a new focus kind of on this period after the completion of cancer treatment and actually had a nearly 500-page report look, entitled From Cancer Patient to Cancer Survivor and Loss in Transition and really looked at ways to improve the quality of life for these over 10 million people in the United States who are adult cancer survivors. And some of the suggestions they had was the development of a survivorship care plan. These are detailed treatment reports that talk about the treatment that was received so that they have a better idea of what the long-term um, adverse events could be related to that treatment, as well as follow-up care plans, what time the CT scans or CEA, some of these other measures need to be done so that it improves communication among um, providers. Also, the development of survivorship clinics. These are specialized clinics that focus on the health and well-being of cancer survivors. And then additionally, I think a lot more research needs to be done looking at the long-term impact of cancer and its treatments so that we can better shape the long-term care of these patients and identify interventions that could be done to improve um, actual treatment and outcomes. So one last study I wanted to, to look at um, that kind of falls in line with the um, improving the actual research base is a study that we did here at UAB, which was looking at long-term survivors of early stage colorectal cancer, so stage one through three, and looked at the risk of cardiovascular morbidity. So this is looking at heart failure or those that patients have had heart attacks. And what we did is actually use the SEER Medicare um, database, which is one of the largest databases in the United States, to look at this and found all those patients with colon cancer and then actually matched those to another group of non-cancer patients that were the same age, had the same medical problems, and were from the, the same geographic areas. And what we found is years after um, their diagnosis and treatment for colon cancer, we saw these dramatic differences in the risk of, of heart failure here. So we saw a 4.2 times higher risk of heart failure compared to patients that did not have a history of cancer. And in addition, here on the right, when we looked at actual cardiovascular disease things such as heart attacks, we actually found a three-fold higher increase in cardiovascular um, 
episodes in, in colorectal cancer survivors. So this is something that's fairly new. We did, was just published this year, but I think things like this suggest, you know, maybe we need to be talking more upfront about the long-term risk of things like adjuvant therapy. And in addition, in, in colorectal cancer survivors, what kind of things do we need to be looking at from cardiovascular health and how maybe we be monitoring these patients better to really identify this and, and, and try to change this? So I did want to lastly briefly mention our Institute for Cancer Outcomes and Survivorship that we have here at UAB, where our mission is really to reduce the burden of cancer and its sequelae across all segments of the population, whether it's older adults and even down into the pediatrics. And this is really through interdisciplinary research, health promotion, and education. And really, we're here to, to seek to design interventions and therapies to help survivors not only survive, but to thrive. And I put down there a link to, to our site and you can see some of the studies and, and some of the members here at UAB that are really focused on these issues and cancer outcomes and survivorship. So I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, a lot of these studies that we were able to do um, with from a lot of the help here at UAB and, and mentors, as well as um, previously I spent many years at, at UNC and Lineberger in, in North Carolina. And it's thanks to them that we've really been able to push a lot of this research forward. And then again, wanted to thank um, the colorectal cancer um, group for having me come on and talk about this very important um, topic. And then I did just want to stop here and take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. What a great um, presentation. Uh, let me just change the setting here. Okay. All right, um, excuse me. So we did have a number of questions come in. Um, let me go ahead and ask you some. I know that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here with the image, but we'll go ahead and dive into some of the questions. So what are your recommendations for older adults to enter clinical trials? Um, do you think that this age group has a good representation currently in clinical trials? No, I think that that's one of the major issues in the field is overall, no, the numbers of older adults on clinical trials is does not really match the, the population. And I think that's really what our goal is. You know, I think any clinical trials, particularly going for drug approval, really should mirror or match that that is of the U.S. population or, frankly, those patients that we treat. Now, there has been some uptick in particularly in the sixth decade of life or seventh decade of life where we're seeing some increases there. Uh, I think one of the challenges there is, you know, those patients that are older adults that are really entering these trials aren't really representative of older adults that we see in the community, and that those are those more super fit patients that, that really have none of these significant medical conditions and are very fit. And, and what I think is really going to be changing the next couple of decades is where we're really going to see the most dramatic changes in this in, is increases in the age of over 70 and 80 year olds that are being diagnosed. And I think that's where we have the, the least amount of data to, to really know what to do with and how to make sense of the clinical trial data we have. So I'd say we've made some steps towards it, but I think those patients that are older adults on the trials aren't really the most representative of all those uh, patients, and that particularly in the more upper extremes of age, you know, we have very, very little data, and those are the ones that are the least represented on clinical trials. Thank but you. That's a great question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Um, I have another question here uh, as it pertains to sarcopenia. Um, is it preventable and if it's preventable what what are some ways that a patient um, can kind of keep that at bay so I think you know this is something that occurs across the lifespan and there's a lot of things that people can do to try to improve or even to, to prevent sarcopenia and and some of that has to do with physical activity or strength building so I think whether it's going for walks or running or even just some strength training bo both those things can have a big impact on maintaining muscle mass and even increasing it you know I think nutrition plays a, a big part of this particularly in the in the cancer patient particularly maintaining your know, calorie intake and, and protein intake during the time of treatment and while they have cancer can be very important because in those patients that are actually undernourished, the first place the body goes to look to replenish those calories is actually stealing them from muscle. So that's really the source of, 
of a lot of um, glucose and protein from the body is in muscle stores. So, you know, if you're not getting adequate nutrition, that's another big area that can be a problem. Now, there are some actual pharmacological studies that have been looking at other drugs that we could actually give to try to either increase or maintain um, muscle mass. And, and some of those have been, you know, it's plus or minus, and they have none of them actually reached drug approval yet, unfortunately. So they, some of them have actually shown increases in the amount of muscle, but didn't show increases in the amount of strength. Now, in those some of those studies, um, they were able to show improvements in quality of life and, and overall um, function, but weren't able to show it objectively from a strength standpoint. So, you know, I think that's a, a not as well known, but I would say overall physical activity and nutrition would be the most important areas to focus on in preventing uh, and even reversing sarcopenia. Okay, so it, it can be reversed, you're saying? Yes. I mean, I think there is an age-related component to it that you can't completely um, reverse, but you can definitely improve upon where you're at and, and try to prevent for, for future losses. Thank you. Oh, it looks like we just had another question come through um, about that, that topic. So thank you for covering that. Um, another question, uh, can you speak to cognitive disabilities older adults may face that could affect their treatment? So I think there's there's two two parts to that kind of is if you have an older adult that has cognitive problems, you know that's definitely been shown and actually specifically studies in, in metastatic colon cancer that those patients are at higher risk for overall not doing well with treatment. Um, you know, so I think when we're diagnosis, I think that's an important area to assess to kind of get a sense as to how a patient will do. On top of that, I think, you know, there is some question that the chemotherapy and the drugs that we use can have an impact on actual cognition itself, and particularly some of the supportive care medicines that we use, you know, things for like pain and steroids, Benadryl, a lot of these medications, anti-nausea medicines can also have a, an important impact on cognition. And we do see increases in cognitive um, impairment in other cancer types. I don't think that's been as specifically studied in colon cancer to my knowledge, but definitely in the setting of transplant and, and hematology diagnoses, multiple myeloma and some other areas, we've seen these breast cancer there's been several studies undergoing cancer treatment that we do see increases in cognitive um, impairment. So I don't know if that's more of an unmasking of what's maybe already there or if we're actually seeing changes in cognition related directly to the treatment. But yes, I'd say it's a very important kind of on, on both ends of that, at diagnosis and actually going forward through treatment, I'd say cognition is a very important thing to assess and, and to really have a conversation about. Thank you. We just have two more questions um, to go through. And again, to the listeners out there, if you do have questions that come up, feel free to type them into your question box. Um, what do you tell patients about cardiovascular health um, at the time of diagnosis and things that they can do to stay healthy? I think that's a great question. And, you know, really in colorectal cancer, the data is a little bit more mixed. So, you know, for other cancers, such as the use of like anthracycline chemotherapy or trastuzumab, there are some very cardiotoxic or cardiac damaging medications that we use. But colon cancer, typically the drugs that we use, we don't typically think of as related to cardiovascular health. So that's not something that is kind of at the forefront of most um, colorectal cancer oncologists when discussing treatment. I think, you know, what we're finding and as well as others is that there is this increased risk in long-term cardiovascular events such as heart attacks and heart failure and I think that that's real I think the challenge is is that we don't often see these impacts until it's much further out from treatment and, and that you know the association between the two hasn't been as well recognized now for 5-FU or capecitabine um, which is one of the common drugs we do there is a short-term risk of, of having some cardiovascular um, or cardiac problems, and that's been fairly well recognized, but that's pretty much in the, the one to two percent realm, so not very high. I think, you know, what I would I counsel a lot of our patients are is that, you know, there are these risks, you know, some of the long-term risks are not as well understood in this population, um, and that really, I think, staying physically fit and avoiding obesity and trying to, you know, improve all your cardiovascular risk factors, keeping control of your cholesterol, all those things are very important, and, and frankly, a lot of those things are very important for your overall overall health and, and potentially even reducing your risk of recurrence of colon cancer with the data on physical activity um, and, and maintaining a non-sedentary lifestyle. So 
So I'd say we don't have a lot of data on this, but I still think it's important to think of your overall health and what you can do to minimize that while we're still you know, learning and figuring out more in this area. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, where do caregivers fit within, uh, within the spectrum of older adults and colorectal cancer? Do you see more challenges with caregivers um, of older patients than you do with younger patients? I think I mean, so. That's another great question, and I think caregivers are very important, particularly for older adults, because these are patients that that actually have a lot of upheaval when it looks at their overall social network. So a lot of their siblings and parents have already passed away, and and they, you know, often don't have as much support and mobility as some other patients, and and I think it really depends on who those caregivers are. So a lot of times these are spouses or someone who lives within the house. Sometimes these are you know younger, these are these are kids, and I. I I do think that you know embracing and understanding who the caregiver is has a, a big impact on, on treatment, understanding what actually may logistically be feasible or not, and understanding what kind of levels of support that a patient has or doesn't have. So I think you know directly focusing on the caregiver is important. There's been some data even recently looking at distress in caregivers, anxiety and depression, and shown that you know the health of the actual patient has a big impact on the caregiver and, and vice versa. So I think, you know, recognizing the importance of caregivers is, is, is very important and actually focusing on the health of a caregiver can be very important even for the outcomes related to the patient. So I think kind of seeing them both as part of the, the process as kind of a dyad between the patient and caregivers is a very important thing. I would say this is kind of a, a more recent uh, approach and focus. We've actually developed a caregiver support group um, and, and program here, but even that is kind of on a small scale that we're slowly piloting out. But I think just overall focusing on caregivers, giving them ways to empower them to help in the management of the patient and understanding their importance to the overall team is, is very important. And I think is being increasingly recognized. And I think that's important for all patients, but even particularly more for older adults with cancer. Thank you. So I think we have time for two more. Um, we have a question that's asking about stages of cancer, I think specifically referring to um, like as an older adult, what, what stage of, of colorectal cancer are you seeing more often? I don't know if that can be like yeah, so I mean, I, I, luckily, majority of colorectal cancer diagnoses are in earlier stage individuals, and, and a lot of that's thanks to, to screening. Um, you know, one of the challenges is in any screening modality, whether it's PSAs, mammograms, or colonoscopies, is, you know, what to do with the upper age ranges. Um, and again, that has a lot to do with life expectancy and deciding, you know, what the benefit of the screening is. Now, on those patients that don't undergo screening, you know, those are the patients that often have more advanced disease, so you're more likely to have stage three or stage four and kind of pick it up at the time when these patients start developing symptoms. So I think, you know, if, at the upper age ranges when you're not doing screening colonoscopies as much, I think there's a higher risk for higher stages at the time of diagnosis. Um, but, you know, thankfully overall, the majority of colon cancers are still kind of caught in those earlier stages where, you know, curative intent is really possible. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that's about all the time that we have. Um, Dr. Williams, I really appreciate your time um, and all the work that you do. Um, thank you so much for presenting. And to all the listeners, thank you for joining today. And any final thoughts, Dr. Williams, before we close out? No, I, I think that's it. You know, thank you so much for, for having me and for kind of focusing on this important area. You know, I think even though this is the vast majority of, of patients with this, I think with this and any cancer, I think it often goes under-recognized. And, and thanks for having us on. And I'm happy to, you know, take any email or questions even after this if anyone has any um, questions or concerns. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. And happy Halloween and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye.